Howdy, 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 and welcome to the Snortcast. My name is Diana Nguyen, and I am the creator of the show, Keeping It Snorting Real. And I would love to find out where you are watching this show from. Please tell us where you're snorting from. And if you are watching it on replay or live, let me know if you are doing that with the hashtag live or hashtag replay. Now, I am really excited to have our guest. He's actually my 10th guest for the Snortcast, which is really exciting, um, which means I've been doing this 10 times in the last four weeks. Um, so thank you so much for your support and love. Um, now, I want to ask you, yep, so just tell me where you're watching from now. What is the Snortcast? The Snortcast is talking to comedians and funny people from all around the world about why and how they do comedy. And also, you know, we are in a pandemic at the moment and it is hard when your livelihood is told to stop. So we'd love to find out from you uh, where, where you're watching from and hang on, I might have to do this again because I feel like it's not on. Blech. No, we're definitely live. Okay, here we go. <laughs> you guys are taking your time coming on right now. All right, so we are live. Sorry, guys. All right, so I'm going to introduce to you my guests, but if you are a snorter, please follow us on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook at The Snortcast, or go to my website at dinawind.com.au slash The Snortcast. Okay, so let's introduce our guest for tonight. Uh, he is very funny, and here is a snapshot of his work. Here we go. Very excited to be here again. Uh, i got to tell you about the weird year that I had. Last year, I lost a fair bit of weight, right? At this point, I've lost a total of about 35 kilos, which is a thank you. No, no, thank you, but don't do that. No, 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 thank you, thank you, thank you, but don't do that because I appreciate it. But at the same time, while 35 kilos is a lot, I mean, I put it there. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I don't think I should be praised for losing something I probably should have never had in the first place, you know? Like, I feel like I have the guilt of a fireman getting a medal when I'm also the arsonist. <laughs> so I do appreciate it, though, because it turns out losing weight was the easy part. It's keeping it off has been an absolute pain in the ass, right? Because everything about the health world is annoying to me. All the food, everything's like kale and keto and kombucha. A lot of Ks. I see three Ks in a row. I'm like, Mwah, I'm out. <laughs> something unsettling about it for me. I've even just recently started going to the gym and in fact even have a personal trainer, a PT. Now, if there are any PTs in the crowd, you know this already. You are a uh, special breed of fuckhead. <laughs> you are. Because on the one hand, it's so incredibly impressive that you've been able to get the discipline to get your body to that level. But on the other hand, <laughs> you're not right. I mean, <laughs> you don't know how to talk to normal people anymore. My PT said to me, come on, Bill, pain is good. Pain reminds you you're not dead. <laughs> Do you know what else is that for me, champion? Ice cream. I feel alive when I have it. <laughs> and stop yelling, engage your core at me. I don't know what you mean. <laughs> but because of my PT, for a very brief moment in time, I was on the roids. Yeah. Hemorrhoids. <laughs> And I warned that weight training. Um, and that's the perfect time to bring you in. Please welcome Bill Rock, Jay Asinia. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> so interesting to look back at all of that. And uh, yeah, what a wild time to be able to perform live and uh, talk about having hemorrhoids. And now yeah. we have to do it over a uh, over Zoom and over podcasts. And yeah, it's well, the same, thought, isn't it? It is the same. And I thought it was a perfect time to pull you pull that clip off so people can go watch and listen to more about your hemorrhoids. Yeah, yeah. Well, my full hour of stand-up uh, is online at the moment and it covers, you know, uh, various revealing stories about myself from, you know, from my drinking days and losing control of my bowels back uh, on Spencer Street on one of the main streets in, in, in Melbourne. So, and it talks about my sobriety as well. So we go through a whole range of emotions. But, yeah, this is nice to be here. I really love your uh, – the uh, – 
the 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 artwork that's there for the snortcast is that uh, done by uh, how did you get that organized you did it yourself dude dude that's incredible well I'm done I'm, I'm a big I'm... fan of people leaning into uh themselves and uh, being accepting and i love that you've embraced the snort because as you know as a comedian when you're on stage if you get a snort from the crowd you're freaking killing it so uh I, I do love that you've embraced that so well done well i did snort at your show last year in 2019 when you did touch into the hemorrhoids like killed me because you were so graphic and was so true like, I was <laughs> fallen i was yeah. Balling. <laughs> yeah i do i do you know what's really funny like people find a lot of my stuff graphic but if you actually an analyze it i never explicitly use the words that people would use it's always i use analogies and metaphors so even when i talk about a uh, particular incident with me uh, and a vacuum cleaner i mean i think you can put two and two together um you know i never actually say i uh, the actual action taking place but it's heavily heavily implied and uh yeah but it is, it is quite a fun place for me to play with being able to you know, do a hor tell a horrific story, but make sure I'm not, uh, you know, ever being explicit with it. It's still horrible. <laughs> well, thank you to the show. And our audience is watching from Australia, Perth. Uh, we've also got Sydney. We've got uh, Botswana, Africa. Oh, wow. I was almost going to go to Botswana next year because uh, I was in South Africa at the start of this year and I went on some amazing uh, uh, game adventures, seeing like safaris and stuff. And I got told that Botswana has some of the best uh, animals to check out. Cincinnati, Ohio. We've got wow. uh, Port. Uh, what's PA? I'm not sure. Uh, that. that's, in, that's America somewhere. Uh, really? Uh, would it be Pennsylvania? Maybe. Mm. That's a good one. <laughs> Let's do geography. That's what we're doing. Thank you so much for joining. And if you were watching, I had a little freak out because I wasn't sure it was live because the comments took too long to come on. But it's all working. Um, and also, people have been asking, um, Dilruk, what the hell happened to your arm? <laughs> it's just a fashion accessory. Uh, but I do, before I talk about the arm, I do love that uh, we we saw you, that was a great example of you being a true artist and a true performer in that moment when you, uh, about the comments not coming in time, because rather than accepting that no one is tuned in, you went, well, the system's broken. Uh, they must be not going live. That That's where, that's, <laughs> that shows that you're a genuine artist. <laughs> So, um, my arm, my arm. I had an accident about three days ago uh, where I tripped on the um, on the road uh, while I was in the middle of a run, and um, and I lost my balance. But I saved my face by dropping my shoulder, and uh, apparently all the scans have come clear that I'm okay. I should be okay. It's still a lot of pain. Like I can't, like I can't do the chicken action. So. Uh, when I'm in the shower, it's really quite awkward to try and clean the pits at the minute. So it's oh, almost like a funnel, having to like funnel it in. But even the left hand, how do you clean your like one pit without the movement of this one? So uh, I'm having some issues. And also when I go to sleep, like when you go to sleep, your shoulder drops and I have to try and put a pillow underneath there. But yes. to get the pillow underneath, I need a hand. So I have to kind of place the pillow roll and then adjust myself and then drop back down and then it's not quite right. So that's where most of my issues uh, over the last three nights have been. No, it sounds like yoga. It sounds like yoga that you're doing it. I don't know if yoga is meant to be this painful though. That's kind of, it's yeah. like, I'm pretty, yeah, I focus on the <laughs> inhaling and exhaling. And here's the weird thing, like people, uh, you know, it's, it, I'm all, I'm, a, I'm big on gratitude and it's something that I've always, thought about is like really how much we take for granted the things that we have until they stop working that's when we go oh man i didn't realize like so losing the mobility in my dominant arm like even brushing my teeth with my left hand has been such a challenge like i give everyone have a crack and try and brush your teeth with your non-dominant hand tonight and see how much weird and awkward it is you feel like you you think you're a capable 35 year old and all of a sudden you're like how does this go does it go like that like how do you brush your teeth yeah, well, we'll find out how how you clean how clean your teeth are after the sling comes off. Yeah, if it, if it's done really well. Um, well, the electric toothbrush it's much easier. Just hold it and you know just move it around. Do the work for you. Um, can I ask who are you? Because you have a pretty interesting story. You had a job before you got into comedy. 
I had a job before and I had a job during comedy for a long time as well. Uh, being pragmatic, I didn't let go of my day job for until I was absolutely too busy with comedy to let go of it. I used to be an accountant. So I'm originally from Sri Lanka and I came here when I was 19 to Australia and then started studying accounting and then got a job at one of the big four accounting firms and then decided that uh, it wasn't for me. I always try and say that carefully. Uh, and luckily for me, my bosses agreed and fired me. And so then I kind of asked myself, like I did this job for six months uh, as a graduate accountant and really didn't like it. And I went, why am I doing something that's so like, I find so difficult, like it shouldn't be that torturous because it's such a high paying job. It's such a, it was the dream job, you know? And I kind of reverse engineered a question of like, I did that job purely for the money. So what if I had all the money in the world, how would I spend my time? And then stand up comedy popped into my head straight away. And I was like, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna become a stand up comedian. And then uh, yeah, about it, like I had that, it was this big aha moment, like the choir started singing and everything. And then it took me about a year before I actually did it because I I was too scared because I have a fear of public speaking. So I kind of kept like avoiding, I kept avoiding it because I also think that because it felt like I failed at accounting, because it was this thing that I'd been studying for for so long, it's why my parents spent a fortune on me to come to Australia. And so I got this feeling like, well, I failed at accounting and what if I try comedy and I'm bad at that as well? I don't want another fail. Like I need, I didn't need two L's in a row. So I think that's part of what, stopped me from even trying because I was just that fear of failure and um, held me back for a long time. And then eventually the pain of doing it and failing wasn't as bad as the pain of never doing it at all. And uh, that's when I had my first gig on the 21st of September, 2010. So we're coming up to nearly 10 years in a couple wow. of months. Uh, next month, yeah. Congrats. And, and the say, good thing the was that after the first gig, though, the first gig, it was shit. So that, that was that was the nice thing. It turns out I was bad at it, but it was uh, the difference was that I didn't care. Like I I cared. Like I loved the process up that led up to that point of performing. That I was like, wow, I've never done anything that I've really enjoyed the process of. So I was like, man, you're shit at this, and you really love it. Imagine if you got good. Like, well, how how much more would you enjoy it then? So I kind of, yeah. I started working for a smaller accounting firm by that point. And I went to their boss's office and asked him for a day off a week. I said, look, I can't quit outright because uh, I still need you, <laughs> but can I get Tuesdays off? And he couldn't understand why I'd sacrifice a day's pay to do something that doesn't pay any money at all. Plus happens at nighttime. He's like, can't you just do that at night and work here full time? I'm like, I just needed to make a mental commitment that like I am serious about comedy and I need one day off a week. And I was down to like four days a week for about three years and then three days a week and then two days a week. And in 2016, I finally went full time with comedy. But yeah, up until then, I kept doing uh, you know my daytime job. And can I ask with with all that? And I loved when you said when it was shit, you still loved it. Like and that made you mm. even want to do it more because you wanted to get good at it as well. Yeah, if, yeah. If you, had, if you had to write a book about that time of your life, what would you call that book? With the specific time during the transition from, you know. Or your or memoir of your life to date now, since 2010, get into comedy, and now where you are in your life in comedy, 2010, 2010. Oh. Or, um, or, uh, I, I would say something <laughs> either like, uh, you know, something with the word uh, gratitude or grateful in it, I think. The great, you know, the, the, the grateful I think I was going to do a show one year called Grateful Great Fool uh, or something like that maybe or The Great yeah. Great Fool or something like The Grateful Great Fool or something. Yeah, something with the word gratitude in the idea because for me everything kind of uh, starts with having a position of gratitude. So it was almost like being grateful for my boss allowing me to have that day off meant that I worked harder at, at the nighttime, the, you know, the comedy job because I was grateful that I had the opportunity to even perform uh, by people who thought, even though I was shit, they were giving me the chance to jump up on stage and do five minutes. And at the same time, I was grateful for the day job because without my boss, my accounting boss, I wouldn't be able to do this full time at night, you know? Because in my head, I decided I'm a full time comedian and a part time accountant. And so by having a sense of gratitude for both those things at the same time, rather than hating on it, uh, it meant that I, I didn't take it for granted. And um, 
And yeah, that boss who you know supported me during those comedy years is now my accountant. So I now give him all that money back pretty much. <laughs> all the money he paid me, yeah. Well, I, I did a TED talk and I talked about joy is my caffeine, joyful, mm -hmm. but F O O L. Yeah. Is it yeah. grateful? F O O L? That's it. Yeah, and so it's, that's why I said so it's like great, G R A G R E A T F O O L, grateful, the grateful, grateful. Grateful, grateful. Love it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Um, so we talked about 2010 was when you got on stage and started mm -hmm. doing comedy for five minutes. But when do you remember in your life when you started using comedy? Like, oh. is there a moment you remember doing something? Yeah. Like Love this. From a very young age, comedy was a uh, very uh, laughter was like a heavy currency that was valued in our family. So I grew up in a house with fourteen people in the one house, and uh, yeah, and so to get people's attention, it was you know difficult. But if you were funny, you'd get the center of attention. So in order yeah. to break through to the uncles and all the aunties, you know. And humor was such a valuable currency that you know you learn to develop it early on in that situation. But also. My dad who worked overseas was a very funny guy amongst his friends when he flew down back to Sri Lanka from overseas. You know, again, I could see he was being held highly by his friends because of how funny he was. So I, I, I kind of uh, realized that, yeah, this is important for me to be funny. And then my brother is kind of probably the main instigator in this because he, whenever I made him laugh, he would go to mom's handbag and uh, steal 10 rupees and pay me. Uh, for a really good joke. And if it was a great joke, he'd give me 20 rupees. So it was very early on where this idea of being funny is something that is of value was instilled in me. And then it kind of, uh, you know, tra kept going throughout my high school and, and uni and stuff. And, and also, interestingly, I always had uh, an awareness that I was never the funniest in any of the situations. Like my brother is always, I always consider my brother to be funnier than me. I had classmates who were funnier than me. I had uh, uni mates who were funnier than me, but I was still the one person that still valued it as the, as quintessentially important thing, you know? Yeah. So you then. Were, uh, yeah, you were already making money in comedy. Yeah, yeah. I earned more money as a child in Sri Lanka than I did for the first five years in Australia as a comedian. <laughs> Amazing. Um, can I ask you, uh, who inspires your comedy? Like, like, who makes who makes you think and makes you go, oh, I want to make write really great work. Right. I mean, that's interesting because I guess it goes through phases. So mm -hmm. I would say the first time I saw stand-up comedy was Eddie Murphy's Delirious. And that was oh. when I was 11, 11 years old. And I think, uh, you know, probably too early to have seen it, but I still, you know, really saw that special, memorized it and just, you know, thought it was incredible. Then fast forward years later, my first ever live stand-up gig I saw was Dave Hughes. And then immediately afterwards, I saw Will Anderson. That was oh, wow. the first time I ever saw live comedy. And uh, and I remember seeing Will's style of comedy and it was it reminded me of how I was funny with my mates rather than being a character like, say, you know, Eddie Murphy is able to do voices and, and things like that or, or you know, seeing like um, Husey having a very specifically funny persona. Like there was technically nothing funny about me. It was just sometimes I would say funny things. Do you know what I mean? Like that's what made me funny wasn't that I wasn't a funny guy. I said funny stuff, you know? Right. And um, and so I think seeing Will inspired me to think that maybe there was a chance for someone like me to do stand-up, you know? I didn't have to be a character, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, Hamish and Andy were a big part of my uh, – when I was working uh, as an accountant, I'd listen to them every afternoon, four to six, and they would like get me through that day almost like going, oh God, like, you know, I'd look forward to being at the desk, listening to them and yeah. then even wake up. Then it wouldn't get good. I would genuinely go to the office the next day and listen to the podcast of yesterday's episode again. You know, like I was a mega fan of, uh, of their, of their radio show. And, and I remember, the, the fact that both Hamish and Andy went to the same uni as me and studied the same course as me, I was like, man, these guys are getting paid to have fun. Like, why not me? You know, like, why, why, sh why can't it happen for me as well? And they kind of set the, the, the ideas in motion as to 
maybe there's a chance for me to do comedy too. Uh, and the fact that I chose stand up specifically is probably because of Will Anderson, you know? So in that way, they all kind of play different roles. And then once I started doing comedy, like more recent times, I would say, you know, I find Celia Pocola, I reckon is probably someone who inspires me the most in terms of stand up and, and, and just in general, her, I think she's the best, one of the, if not the best, she's the best joke writer uh, and and performer in the country right now in terms of you know stand up. But also the thing I love about her stand up is that it's so honest and it's mm -hmm. never it's it's sometimes really heavy, but it's never not funny. She's it's like you're almost always in a happier place, even though she can be talking about something that's quite dark and painful to her at the time, you know, at the time of it happening. And I think that is an incredible skill to be able to do that, to be able to entertain hundreds of people uh, who are in a good mood while you're talking about something that is quite, uh, you know, near and dear to you. And that all comes down to her ability to write an amazing, uh, incredible joke, you know what I mean? To be able to keep it funny every step of the way and still be as super honest about where she's at. So I would say someone like her, I find a lot of inspiration from as well. My, my, my top three is Ali Wong, Dave Chappelle, oh, yeah. Robin Williams. Cause I'm a, I'm a trained yeah. actor. And when Robin yeah. Williams is on stage, he's just electric. Like you see, you see everything in his body alive. Um, and right. This is soul. He isn't with us yeah. anymore. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, can I? I think it's really good as well because, like, yeah, it's the brilliant thing about comedy is that it is such a such a subjective thing. It's like people can get very specific about what they find funny and what's not funny to them. But you know, if you use the same standard as you do for cuisines, like, not everyone's going to love every single cuisine that's out there. But there's certain cuisines that you know people love or people want to go to that particular type of food, even though it's not for everyone. And the important thing is to make sure that you are creating something that you would enjoy. I, I, for me, at least, I always wanted to make sure that I was creating a cuisine that was, you know, enjoyable to me. And if I can find other people that enjoy it as well, then I can keep developing that idea. But, you know, so someone like Robin Williams is someone I think is incredibly funny. And I love, you know, uh, you know, Aladdin's one of my top five films of all time. And it has 100% to do with him. And um, but I would never say that my style of comedy is influenced by him. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You you don't have to like the people think it's this thing that you have to be like that person, otherwise you're not doing comedy correctly. Yeah. Um, we've actually had someone inspired by your joke, John Ambler from Sydney. What's the difference mm. between a big vacuum cleaner and your job? After five yeah. years, your job still sucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're still um Thanks for joining us from, so we had Brian from City, uh, how do you say that? Cincinnati? Bam, got yeah. it. English is my second language. Um, and we also, where we have, yeah, we've got Dave Chappelle, uh, we've got uh, Ahmed from City, and we've got, I think, from Germany as well. Thanks for joining. It was amazing that you're listing out the different people brought, like, in and in there in that list of armored and all these people you said dave Chappelle. so are you saying that dave Chappelle has joined us in this podcast is it right so between writing netflix uh doc netflix specials he's joined the snodcast how amazing what a nice treat to meet you dave yeah if dave Chappelle was in the room oh my god i would pee my pants literally <laughs> um so you know we've talked about other people's style of craft of how they use comedy in their work and because the audience here are predominantly LinkedIn, a lot of people mm. want to put comedy into their speaking, you know, gigs or their presentation. How have you used comedy uh, in your work? Like, what's your style? Um, I mean, it's hard to want to answer because my work is comedy. I guess if I was to use the ideas as to how comedy can help, say, a more traditional corporate job, I would say it, it is about being able to disarm for uh, your audience. You know what I mean? I think the first thing that any anyone needs is the ability to get their attention. And humor is a great way to bring that attention. And humor is another great way to, you know, uh, disarm them by, say, if you make fun of yourself or, you know, being able to uh, allow that idea that you are something that isn't um, sacred, and is beyond uh, being made fun of, people can gravitate towards that because you're not 
talking above them and looking down on them, you're lowering them to almost like an even playing field. And I think yeah. humor does that really well. And ultimately, as w I think I find the biggest lesson I've taken away from my years of being a comedian is authenticity, is the idea that what really is funny at the end of the day between all the people I named, from Hamish and Andy to Dave Chappelle to, to Eddie Murphy, is they are authentic to who they are. So Robin Williams is nothing like a Will Anderson, so to speak, but Will Anderson is truly Will Anderson when he performs, and Robin Williams is truly Robin Williams, and Hamish and Andy are themselves. Like, And, you know, that, and being yourself doesn't mean that you have to be a real person. You can be a character, but that's authentic to who you are as that character. Do you know what I mean? Like, like Borat is one of the most authentic characters that, you know, people, the identities. Do you know what I mean? It, and it's the same with Bruno, played by two, the same dude. But you know what I mean? It's about what's real. So... Uh, so the idea, I guess, is if you're authentic as if you're pre while you're presenting, people will gravitate to that. And that authenticity, a real good way to bring people in is through humor. So I would say that's one of the best things to, that I've learned from doing comedy is that as long as it's authentic to who you are, then you'll get their attention because there's a collective consciousness that they can smell bullshit. Individually, they might not be able to smell bullshit, but at, you know, if you're being true to who you are, then they, they'll get there. And that's one of the good things about comedy is like, say there's a technical stuff up, you can make fun of it. You know, whereas if you're someone who is presenting yourself as this flawless character that, you know, I get shit done and I don't, you know, I don't uh, fuck around or whatever. And all of a sudden, you know, the, the, the wrong slider showed up, you look, you look silly. But if you can embrace that silliness and have, be playful with it, people lower their guard and will give you more respect. Yeah. I think what I really loved about watching your show is that you drop in to the personal. Like, um, I love the show. I did see a show in 2018 when you talked about your mum and dad and how mm -hmm. they're two different uh, religions. Yeah. But they fell in love and so did you. You went to a, ca a Catholic school, was that right? Yeah. So I have a Buddhist father, Muslim mum, and I went to a Catholic school. Yeah. <laughs> the main so comedy it's a comedy yeah. yeah and it's some it's the those are the type of things that i initially when i started comedy i thought i don't i shouldn't talk about because that's not relatable like what's so relatable about having mixed religion parents and going to a different school and whatever it's like it doesn't matter because it's authentic to me that's my story and people are interested in wanting to hear someone's story you know yeah. um we've, we've got we've got some people commenting when i said don't pay well, I'm not. I've, I've got to host a show with Dill Rock right now. Um, why, what if, why don't be? Is like, that a reference to a previous podcast? Yeah, before, what I just said before, like five minutes ago. Um, we also had Charlie Chaplin as one of the best ever comedians. And, you know, he's legendary. He's from the black and white era. Um, mm. You know, started from the bottom, now we're here. Um, my next question to you is, no, I you? dressed up as Charlie Chaplin when I was a child, actually, for a costume party. So there you go. Yeah. In, yeah. Sri I, I, in Sri Lanka. I tried to do learn his walk and stuff like that. I uh, Yeah, I guess I loved comedy even earlier than I realized. I my earliest memories would have been Mr. Bean, I remember. Mr. Bean and Jim Carrey, seeing their oh. physicality, I used to stand in front of the mirror and try and, like, mimic. And I actually was able to, like, you know, m manipulate my face in this awful Dude. way. Just from, yeah, I know, I know. And, and like be able to move my head like like a wig and yeah so yeah. I, I tried them all <laughs> and then I realized I just have to be me <laughs> your, your flyer this year was it last year you do have you can you do not distort your face the, yeah do I have eyebrow. a flyer with my face to, I, I mean no, I, I think, think every eyebrow. Yeah. Every 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 year for the last, I've done seven one-hour shows, and I'm pretty sure every one, every poster has had the eyebrow in there, some way or the other, as featured. <laughs> there was a year where I was a picture when I was 14 years old, and I had the monobrow. So uh, there has been an eyebrow reference in every poster so far. Yeah. No, oh, great. Love it. No, I, I haven't been studying the posters. Just letting you know. Just noticed them. <laughs> you had an eyebrow. That's good. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad. Now let's talk about touring because your career, I look, look I, I was surprised from reading your bio that you started in 2010 because when I got into comedy, I think you were just about to hit the hot spot. Um, I've been doing comedy since 2016 and I felt like you'd been 
yeah, I've just been watching you kind of explode in the last couple of years because, you know, you've been on TV. You also got invited to perform at Just For Last Montreal, which is like, you know, we say Edinburgh is the mecca of comedy, which I've performed. You've done, you're, you're done your tour there. But there's something mm. about Montreal because it is invite. It is curated. Yeah. How was it to be invited to perform at Just for Laughs? It, it was uh, it was so incredible. It was genuinely one of the uh, you know the cool coolest things to happen to me. And uh, I'm a like I'm I basically describe myself as a comedy nerd who who scammed his way to the other side of the microphone. You know I. Uh, I, I even even once I started headlining here in Australia, I would still pop in at comedy gigs just to watch from the back of the room because I love stand up so much. So to be able to get invited to go to Montreal uh, is as a fan was huge because I got to see all these amazing shows and amazing performers, um, you know, live. And then I kept forgetting. I kept having this joke with the director because I kept saying to him, "I'm like ah." Oh, I can't believe you got me performing. I'm like, I can't watch this show now because of this. And she's like, oh, sorry, Dil. Next time I invite you, make sure that you won't have any gigs at all. You can just come and watch the shows. So obviously, like, it, it was it was really cool that, uh, you know, I, I think it's uh, maybe like around 10 or less than 10 people per year go from Australia. So the fact that, you know, I was one of the people picked, it was pretty cool. And, uh, yeah, I, I it was incredibly exciting. I was just like a kid in a candy store and uh I, and i i yeah i hope it's one of those things that uh people get to you know in any version of their careers that there's something like that that they all get to experience that feeling of being able to witness some element of your work that is done you know in, in on a more global scale so like i'd be there um, you know, a, 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 and there'll be people from SNL or, or you know, Pete Holmes, one of my favorite American pod, uh, comedians. They're all like hanging out in the same room and uh, discussing jokes and, you know, things like that. I, I, I was just, just completely nerding out, you know? And wow. uh, it was, yeah, it was really cool. I can see the joy. I can see the joy in you. <laughs> the, you know, the idea to be invited, but to, to do something that you love is like the double whammy. Like that's the, that's yeah. the goal. I think so. And for me, I think I was always very conscious to make sure I clearly defined what I was describing as success within this comedy world because the, the goalpost is so broad. And to me, ultimately, all I really wanted was to be able to live off it and be able to pay rent and, and, and you know, do that full time. And once I achieved that, for me, everything since then, I just treat it as a bonus rather than an entitlement. So for me, when those opportunities do then happen, it comes from a place of like, oh, thanks for this extra thing, as opposed to going, it's about fucking time, you know? <laughs> so it, it, it really, by keeping that level of what I consider success was being able to live off it because I love doing this so much that very secretly, I would probably do it for free, but don't tell anyone that. So the thing is that, yeah, exactly. So so being able to do all these things, like something like Montreal, is a, you know, here's a good example of what I mean. There was a time in 2012 when Will Anderson was performing in November at uh, the Comics Lounge in North Melbourne here, and I bought a ticket to go watch him. So I'd been doing comedy a couple of years at that point, so I get to watch him because he's one of my favorites. And um, I'm such a fucking idiot that I hadn't listened to my voicemail, and there was a message from his management asking me to open for him. And I, the voicemail was like three weeks old. So I thought I'd missed my opportunity. And I desperately like calling them. I'm like, please, please, please have me on. And then it turns out they were like, oh, yeah, you're still in. It's fine. If you're free, we're happy to give it to you. So I ended up performing at a gig that I bought tickets to watch. You know, so so for me, I try and everything that I've done since 2016, I always look at it like, oh, these are all the things that I would pay money to watch. I just happen to be on the the other side of the microphone. Yeah. So can I ask, really. Can I ask yeah? you? Um, you know, the 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 goal is to perform tour, but in twenty twenty. Sorry, you dropped the out there. Fun. The goal. The the goal is what? So the goal, our goal in life, in our work, is to perform, right? But in twenty twenty, COVID hit us, um, mm -hmm. and we're told not to perform. How have you dealt with that? How have you dealt with COVID? Uh, 
perform. Yeah, it, it, it was really challenging because, you know, doing stand-up is like my favorite thing, one of my absolute favorite things in the world. Uh, weirdly, though, in the last couple of years with my therapist, I've been trying to work towards disassociating my sense of self-worth to the job because it got wow. to that point where I, I am someone who loves stand-up so much that it got too much attachment to the idea of doing it well meant that I can feel good. But if, it, if I have a bad gig, that means I'm failing at life. And I didn't want that up and down of emotions because, you know, you know, bombing and having bad gigs are always around the corner. You can't like, at least if the way when I'm writing a new show, the first, you know, month or so of the new material, there's a lot of dying on stage and, you know, not getting laughs. And I wanted to be able to still feel comfortable enough to bomb on stage. So I've worked a lot on trying to separate the, the, the pride that I have in my work and separate the pride in myself and not make it be one and the same. So for me, once COVID hit, it was a case of testing all that work that I put in to see if I truly have been able to push myself away from being like, hey, I'm I'm a good person worthy of love and respect because I'm a stand-up comedian. Like, no, I'm I deserve those things anyway. The fact that I do stand-up comedy is just a bonus on top of the things that I need to do to feel love and respect for myself. So that was the first thing that I realized that was coming into play. But then what I did was I even stripped back stripped it back further to try and identify what was it about stand-up that I really loved? What was it about this job that made me so passionate about it? And mm -hmm. it was the idea that my ability to be funny uh, was a thing that I enjoyed because it's that, that you get, it was getting my ideas and presenting it in a funny and creative, creative way to people to have a sense of escapism, you know? And, and that bare bone of it can be done through my podcast or it could be done on Instagram or it could be done on a, you know, a video like this or whatever. So I'm like, yay, I don't get the same immediate validation like I get from comedy, from stand-up because I'm an egotistical maniac and I love that attention. Uh, but I can still find that bare bones of why I like that job and still find ways to replicate it in other areas. So it's still not the same, but I still, you know, it, it's manageable because of that. That's that's really beautiful to hear that you've found that that spot of just going, um, yeah, disassociating to just the performance of why you do what you do. Like for me, I realize that everything that I've done in the performing arts has been to be in joy. Um, so you know, when you talked about your podcast and doing all other things. It's still, it's yeah, it's it doesn't kill you that you're not performing on stage because everything mm -hmm. else that you do has the same connection of performance. Yeah, or, yeah, I have to try and find it still, but it was like it's almost like the stand up was like a like a hardcore injection of that, like a really concentrated dose of that thing that I love, you know, and I was getting it every night and just yeah. feeding off it for like 10 years. So now I can't get that same high, like heavy dose, but I can get like a, you know, a meth drip version of it, you know, a drip feed of it. Um, we're going to get some questions from my audience here. So Joseph's asking if there was a movie made on your life, who would play your character? I am arrogant enough to say me. <laughs> you know what? I would me cut I would cast myself and I would digitally uh, make myself look younger and older as required. I, uh, I don't want to uh, put anyone else uh, in, the, in, the, in that role. But let's say for whatever reason I couldn't cast myself. Uh, I, I think Kumail Nanjiani has the same eyebrows. So, you know, maybe I'll get, uh, he probably, and he's funnier than me as well. So I don't know if I could stand to, you know, see someone you know, funnier and, and in better shape than me play me. But uh, there's a whole bunch of people from Bollywood that I reckon I can tap into. That's it. And look, he could win an Oscar and you did win a Logie. So, you know, win-win yeah, for yeah, everyone. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, another question we've got is, is there a special technique for storytelling in comedy? Maybe a quick... Uh, yeah, I would say may if, you, uh, if you can, make sure that every sentence is necessary. Because certain stories, you don't, you'd be surprised to figure out the details that you think you need when you're telling a friend. Because we, the difference between telling, doing stand up, story to stand up or telling a friend is there's context that your friends might have. So certain details, like, you know, about 
you know, Waza or whatever, he, he they already know who you're talking about. Whereas when you're doing it publicly, they, you have to build too much context to try and explain why what, you know, Joffa said is important in this story. So mm -hmm. being able to kind of break it down to the bare bones of what, why the story is funny uh, makes the storytelling easier, I would say. Thank you. Thank you for that tip. Um, we've got an audience saying, love the chat, Dil Rock and Diana. I'll play myself as well. There we go. We've got other egotistical people in the world. Um, Dil Rock, thank you so much for joining the show and sharing My pleasure. your um, and your joy. It was so great to hear and you talk about um, Montreal and we're looking forward to hearing about your book. My book, yeah, yeah, the grateful, grateful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, already. Thank you to the audience for watching the show, The Snortcast. Your support is amazing. Please follow us at The Snortcast on all the social media handles. And this show is sponsored by my Patreon community. Thank you so much for believing in my work. And we'll see you all next week. Thanks, Dilrook. No worries. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. And we're just going to show a quick exit video. Here we go. Your credits. Oh, wow. Yeah, baby. <laughs> <laughs>